This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Joachim and I am happy to have uh, Thomas with me as well. I got a small echo here. I will. So, welcome to this webinar. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Joachim and I work at Know How Solution in Sweden. Uh, I have listed some names here. Uh, Jürgen, my colleague in Sweden, but also my colleague Henrik in Finland, in, in Denmark, and also Marco in Finland, who you can contact if you have questions about Bluetooth uh, products that we are selling at NOAA. I will just uh, say that this uh, um, session will be recorded. So we will have about uh, 60 minutes, one hour, and uh, you can get a link after this. And today Thomas is going to talk about mainly the Bluetooth uh, version 5 and different applications. I will just show one slide about know-how before I hand over to you, Thomas. So basically we are uh, in know-how headquarters in Malmö but we have offices in um, Herlev and also in Finland, Espo. So what we are fo focusing on is um, tools for embedded development. Uh, so may mainly we have tools, debuggers, compilers, and so on. We have other tools like uh, static analysis, unit testing tool, architectural testing tool, uh, and test automation tool. We also have some uh, tools for Bluetooth testing that we're going to talk about today. We have also CAN products. Uh, we also have um, both from, from Peak and from Pixat. And we have also some ALM product uh, requirement management, test management, and so on. So that was very shortly about know-how and you can co contact us anytime. Okay. Can you hear me, Thomas? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. I don't uh, know if the sound went through here. Some was... I got a comment that I, I cannot hear, but I hope it... So I switch over uh, to you. Okay. Um, I can uh, share my screen. Share. Okay, share. Okay, you can see my screen now, can you? Yes. Okay, uh, well, thanks for the introduction, Wilhelm. Um, my name is Thomas O'Reilly, and uh, I work with Teledyne LaCroix. Um, Teledyne LaCroix is uh, the name of the company today, but it used to be called Frontline Test Equipment, and uh, Teledyne LaCroix bought over frontline test equipment in 2016. So uh, just some information contained here in this classified, you know, so you can read that and take it as, as you will. Um, Thomas? Somebody, so, yeah, somebody can't hear. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Let, let's see. I think it must be something to do with their <clears throat> speaker on their PC. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah, I got something. But, yes. But yeah, let's um, co let's continue. Uh, okay. So today we're just going to go over in general <clears throat> some um, you know uh, discussion about the Bluetooth specification, the Bluetooth SIG, and where we fit into all of that and the different terminologies. Um, a little bit about Teledyne and LaCroix. Uh, who are we? Uh, we're a global company. Uh, it's a listed company, but we have a headquarters in, in EMEA or Europe. Um, European headquarters is in Heidelberg. We have sales offices in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Italy France, UK, and Sweden. And we also have a, a wide range of uh, indirect product specialists uh, like KnowHow, who are distributors or resellers depending which name you want to uh, identify them as. So a lot of cover, um, a lot of products, and a lot of activity uh, uh, on a global basis. Uh, on a global basis, we have uh, customers worldwide, and we have been servicing those customers for many, many years, both as Frontline and as Teledyne McCoy. Uh, and our mission statement is to accelerate our partners' time to market, increase their product quality, and ensure a superior end user experience for their customers through our product services and consulting. So we're not just selling boxes, as they say, we provide um, backup, we provide uh, support, uh, we, we provide consultancy. So um, it's not just a, a catalog reseller uh, as such, we can give you a lot more. Uh, Teledyne Bluetooth expertise, we've been uh, in the Bluetooth business since the beginning. Uh, when I say we, I'm including Frontline in that as well. So we keep up to date with all of the latest Bluetooth specification. That's uh, very vigorous ongoing work all of the time. So there's a lot of work involved in keeping up with the specification. <clears throat> we do a, something called IOP test services. IOP meaning interoperability uh, testing. Interoperability testing is very important for wireless technologies because uh, you, can, you can have two devices from two different manufacturers, two different implementations. So they're both conforming to the specification and you're going to get, of course, different interpretations of the specification, glitches. So lots of interoperability problems and you need to do lots of interoperability testing. And we support that. <clears throat> we can do the testing or we can create the test cases for you. But it's a very, very important part of the, the whole cycle of developing and bringing a product to market. <clears throat> the test tools that are needed uh, to do that work and to keep up with the specification, we have all of those test tools uh, from the very bottom, like the RF testers. You need to do physical layer testing or production line testing on RF. We have the products for that. We have compliance. Uh, conformance testing tools, and then we have the protocol analyzers for the over-the-air captures. We attend many of the industrial events like inter uh, Unplug Fest. So these are engineering events worldwide that we support and we attend and we support our customers there. So a little bit about who controls the whole Bluetooth thing, uh, the name and all of that. So the governing body of Bluetooth uh, is somebody called the Bluetooth SIG. Bluetooth SIG is a non-profit organization that's based in the US, but they have offices in Asia uh, and personnel in Europe as well. Uh, it creates the specification or owns a specification. Uh, the guys who create the specification or the working groups, uh, these are all different people from different companies that are part of the Bluetooth SIG. Uh, and they, they create, they spend a lot of time and a lot of resources creating the specifications <clears throat> and what they get out of that is they can drive the specification towards um, their markets. Um, approved device for conformity, conformity to specification. So you need to, uh, if you have the Bluetooth logo, this is the Bluetooth logo. If you have that on your device, then you need to uh, conform to the test cases and all of that. And Bluetooth SIG have a something called Launch Studio, which uh, enables you to do self-testing on some of the profiles. Um, they also, Bluetooth SIG also sponsor interoperability events. These are what we call the unplug fests, UPFs. There's usually 
three every year, one in North America, one in Europe, and one in Asia. And we as a company attend those events and support those events. Typically, those events would hold maybe up to 300 engineers from around the globe, and they all sit for one week testing face-to-face -face their implementations uh, to iron out any bugs. Uh, it's a closed event, but an engineering event, but a very important event. Then uh, about the Bluetooth SIG membership uh, and, you know, and uh, the working groups. So the membership is roughly evenly divided around the world. Uh, in the Americas, 34% uh, listed companies, APEC and EMA, uh, you know, you could say 30, 30, 30, 30% um, a third uh, Asia, uh, Europe and um, America. So it's growing all of the time. Every year we're getting new members attending the Bluetooth SIG. So uh, right now in 2018, which is some time back, there were 34,000 uh, companies registered. Then the working groups, there are 15 different working groups. So you could have a working group for hands-free car kit. You could have a medical working group. You could have a uh, audio working group. So there are different 15 different working groups uh, for diff 15 different sectors of interest. Um, so lots of people, lots of uh, work going on there, and uh, they are, it's, uh, it's free to sign up and become uh, part of those working groups, but you do have to be registered with the Bluetooth SIG, uh, and there are different level, levels of membership there. Uh, devices, so the market is very strong for Bluetooth. It's growing exponentially every year. Uh, you can see year on year, we have different um, Bluetooth uh, increase in the market in shipments and, and devices. Um, then uh, this graph on the right hand side is showing us a little bit about, uh, we're going to talk about the different types of Bluetooth specification. You have Bluetooth low energy, you probably heard about that. So 90% of all Bluetooth devices will include Bluetooth low energy by 2023. Uh, Classic or BREDR has been around for a very long time. Um, so that's still growing. Uh, and the annual Bluetooth low energy single mode shipments uh, set to triple. So low energy is the one that's growing fastest. So you can see here on the graph, BREDR is blue. Uh, BREDR plus LE, that's what we call dual mode. And LE, LE is this exponential growth rate here. Classic is stabilizing here and the dual mode which would be classic and low energy on one chip um, is also growing that would be because that's in the mobile phones so how and where does it work um, so it's basically uh, conception came in 1994 uh, the three first three companies that came together were ericsson nokia and ibm uh, and basically, they wanted to make the, the phones talk to the PCs without a connection. They wanted a wireless connection. So intended as a wireless communication to replace RS-232 cables. Um, it's in the ISM band. Uh, that's a free band worldwide, so that gives it a huge advantage. Um, there are two standards, classic and low energy. Uh, there are the two spec specifications. We'll talk more about those. It uses something called adaptive frequency hopping. I'll talk a little bit more about that, AFH. It's important uh, and it makes the, um, makes the technology work very well in a busy, noisy environment. It's good for what something we call coexistence. Um, the classic Bluetooth hops on 79 channels, one meg wide channels, and low energy uh, uses 40 channels. So there's totally different. Classic cannot talk to low energy, or low energy cannot talk to classic, but um, a device could hold both. And the specifications are controlled by the Bluetooth SIG, uh, as we mentioned, and the, the latest specification is something called 5.2. And all of the versions are backward compatible. So if a 5.2 device is talking to a, a 4.0 device, uh, they'll fall back to the 4.0 specification, so it's all backward compatible. Uh, a little bit of general knowledge about the name. Uh, it was Bluetooth, Harald Bluetooth was a Danish king. 
in these years, 935 to 986. And his idea was to um, bring all of the different nations together. Uh, so the idea was to bring the different technologies together so that they could communicate together um, with all kinds of devices. And the Bluetooth logo is built up of uh, the Nordic runes. So H is this uh, Nordic rune, and uh, B is this, and they combined them to make this Bluetooth logo. Um, and this is a family photograph of Harold Bluetooh and his family. ISM band, it's uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, as I said, it's a free band worldwide. Uh, that has that's an advantage, but it has other disadvantages in that it's very populated. Um, Wi-Fi 802.11 also resides on the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. Uh, car, cordless phone, phones like DEPT, which are important, um, which are popular in Europe, also reside there. Uh, stereo headsets, microwave ovens, very noisy as well. So it's a busy area. Uh, so coexistence is very uh, important and we need to manage it um, and we'll look at that. Uh, I mentioned it was frequency hopping, so classic Bluetooth would have 79 channels and it's hopping at 1600 hops per second uh, over 79 channels. Uh, and that's a good thing, it's a, an advantage um, in that you have, uh, if you look at this, this is the frequency chart here. These are Bluetooth packets that are hopping 1600 hops over all of the channels. Uh, they're small packets, so if you lose a small packet, it can be resent quickly. Um, whereas with Wi-Fi, uh, this could be construed as a Wi-Fi channel here, sitting on channel one or something. Wi-Fi sits in the same place all of the time uh, in general. Uh, and if it's experiencing interference, then it's going to get a very hard time, whereas Bluetooth can avoid uh, noisy channels and just hop on the free channels. That's something we call adaptive frequency hopping AFH. So AFH was something that was introduced into the uh, Bluetooth spec to avoid um, avoid coexistence issues with Wi-Fi mainly. And frequency hopping, uh, who are these people? <laughs> these are the guys that really came up, the mathematicians that came up with it. This lady, uh, as a general knowledge, is uh, Hedy Lamer. She was a famous Hollywood actress as well, but in her early days, she was uh, a very clever lady that uh, helped to uh, invent, if you like, the frequency hopping um, technology. And that was used, uh, that was developed during the war because um, they uh, were using uh, frequency controlled torpedoes during the war uh, and they were sitting on a single frequency, but um, the enemy quickly figured out what that frequency was and were able to take control of the torpedo and turn it around and send it backwards. So that wasn't working, so they needed to come up with the frequency hopping spectrum. Okay, just a bit of general knowledge. Um, the purpose of Bluetooth is to replace the cables. So that's uh, its uh, main function is to um, become a wireless communication so that you can plug virtually plug two devices together without a cable over a wireless communication. Uh, and the other goals were low cost. Uh, you wanted a low cost chip, low power, and short range. So it's it's and it's mainly peer to peer. Uh, in general, classic Bluetooth certainly is peer to peer, um, and device to device, uh, and within within a very short range. And I can remember when Bluetooth was being developed, they were talking about a five dollar chip, and in the early days that was deemed as impossible. But of course, you, as you know now, that uh, Bluetooth chips are. Uh, below the one, well below the one dollar mark. So a, a great achievement, uh, and that's why it's so popular. So Bluetooth evolution, uh, first of all, we had what we call classic Bluetooth. Classic Bluetooth and BR and EDR mean the same thing. Uh, people use different names. Uh, so basic rate, enhanced data rate, two different versions of the first uh, version of Bluetooth, the classic version. And then uh, later on, we developed a low energy specification. Uh, the low energy is not to do with transmission energy, it's to do with battery power consumption, the energy on your battery. So we needed a uh, coin cell battery, low power consumption, low battery power consumption, 
And that's what low energy is all about. Um, and the main function of the specification, I always think of low energy is to turn the radio off. Um, and when the radio is off, you're saving power. So sometimes I'll refer to as 4.0, Bluetooth version 4.0, or BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. 4.0 introduced the Bluetooth Low Energy specification, but 4.0 also includes BREDR specification. So both are combined in, uh, in only one specification. A dual mode chip supports classic and low energy. So most of your mobile phones will have a dual, dual mode clip uh, or a dual mode chip. That means they can both do classic and low energy all on the same chip, all on the same radio. And that's another huge advantage. You don't need to have a new radio for the new low energy specification. Uh, suited to devices that need to transfer small amounts of data and frequently uh, now includes Bluetooth 5, 5.1, 5.2 specification. We'll look at those specs and what they bring uh, further on. Something else that was added is Bluetooth Mesh. Bluetooth Mesh is a, kind of a, another specification or a use case that sits on top of the Bluetooth specification. Uh, very important, very powerful. Uh, and an, another exciting uh, use case, but um, you could do another. We could do another seminar on that someday. Uh, as I mentioned, interoperability, uh, ISM band, very important. Uh, many other devices use the ISM band 802.11b, G, and M. This is Wi-Fi uh, and the cordless phones. And here is an image of a spectrum, a Bluetooth spec. Uh, 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 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and I'm showing you here a heat map of the energy level in the background from a sniffer. Uh, this would be channel 37, channel 38, channel 39 over time. But you can see the blue energy is non-Bluetooth traffic in the background. So it's a very noisy environment. This would be a, a typical Bluetooth stack. Uh, the Bluetooth stack, um, is a the software protocol stack that resides on the chip uh, and uh, drives the communication for the application. So lots of it's a complicated stack, especially for classic Bluetooth. So uh, a lot of work going on there. And uh, you have your baseband, basically your radio at the bottom. You have the different files, the different physical layers. Then you have logic channel channels, attribute protocol. So that's your Bluetooth stack. In order to debug or know what's going on uh, on your Bluetooth stack when it goes over the air, you'll need to have Bluetooth sniffers. You need to have an RF tester uh, for the baseband, production line tester. So we provide all of those tools and we have the experience to know what's going on uh, for that development. And as I say, we've uh, developed those tools since the beginning, since specification 1.0 right up to 5.2 today. Uh, and so we progressed as a specification progressed. And this, this chart, you don't need to know everything in it, but at the bottom left-hand corner, we started 1.0. Uh, then the next significant change was version 1.2. Uh, we, in, we introduced here the adaptive frequency hopping, which I met, talked about, faster connection. These are all of the features. Um, version 2.1 was also a significant change. There was um, a higher encryption uh, mechanism to introduced. Yes, yeah, something called secure simple pairing was introduced here in 2.1, and that was significant. That was actually a hardware, a chip hardware change. Uh, 4.0, we mentioned, was a low energy introduced on 4.0 specification. Uh, then the next big one was Bluetooth 5.0. Now, this was a quantum leap for low energy specification. This is all about growing the low energy spec by 5.1 and 5.2 are mainly focused on the low energy development, developing new use cases. Uh, and we'll go over those a little bit. And we, again, our tools support all of the specifications, the different specifications. Um, these devices actually are software defined radios. So uh, I mentioned here, for example, 2.1 needed a hardware change, a new chip, um, and that meant that the BPA600, which was using Bluetooth radios, 
uh, we had to change the hardware inside here. But with the software defined radio, you don't have that problem because it's all software firmware changing only. Uh, let's talk about classic VREDR. Um, so basic rate, enhanced data rate. The basic rate was one megabits per cycle, but today it's all EDR, enhanced data rate on the classic um, Bluetooth specification. Um, basic rate um, had a short life and enhanced data rate two megabits per second. Uh, and the uh, modulation that was used there is, is in use today. So, uh, as I said, Bluetooth is um, hopping on uh, channels. Uh, you know, for classic Bluetooth, it's 1600 hops per second over 79 channels. And it sends out packets of information. So, these packets that are sent out on Bluetooth slots, a Bluetooth slot is 625 microseconds long, and you send a packet out. Um, you can send some packets out on three Bluetooth so uh, slots together. So when we talk about packets, you know, there are many different packets. These are data packets, uh, a one slot, a three slot, or a five slot pa data packet. Then we had the two megabit, which is the enhanced data rate, one slot, three slot, five slot, DH5 packets. Um, then, for example, you had, uh, what else? Yeah. So for if you have a lot of data to send out, you'll be sending out a lot of three DH5 packets. If you don't have much data to send out, you could revert back to DH1 packets, which is a much smaller um, packet and a much smaller data rate. We have other types of packets called ID packets, null packets, poll packets. Null and poll packets are really packets that are sent between the devices. The master will send uh, one to the slave, and the slave will send another one back. Uh, and these are just for keeping the Bluetooth clocks in sync between the two devices. ID packets are identification packets. When you want to connect to a device, you send out ID packets and you say, uh, I, I want to connect to you and this is my address. Uh, an FHS packet would be a frequency hop select packet. That's a very important packet. Uh, when two devices are making a connection, uh, there, there's one FHS packet sent out. And inside that packet is the hopping sequence, the hopping sequence that the network is going to use, what we call the PicoNet is going to use. Um, so for a sniffer, uh, if we don't get this FHS, FHS packet, we don't know the hopping sequence of the PicoNet and we're out. Then these HV and the, uh, all of the V packets, these are voice. Um, so there's a different type of link used for um, what they call a SCO channel. Uh, for voice, if you're making a phone call, then you use these voice, uh, there are lower data rates. So, as you can see, it's quite complex, lots of packets, lots of different types of packets. Um, so, that's, uh, we're moving on to the profiles. Just before we go to the profiles, uh, we talked about Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy. So, you know, Bluetooth Classic is used for streaming applications, applications such as audio streaming, file transfer and headsets. So it's got a higher data rate, um, and that's when you, but it uses a lot more power. And uh, the low energy would use uh, sensor data, control of devices, and low bandwidth applications. So if you don't have much data to send, low energy is a good uh, application for that, for sensors. Um, classic is not optimized for low power, um, and low energy is meant for, for low power, low duty data cycle low power consumption. Um, Classic operates over 79 RF channels. Uh, low energy only uses 40 RF channels, but they're twice, twice the width. Um, discovery occurs on 32 channels. So when you're looking for a, another searching for another device, you can search it. Uh, you're searching on 32 channels. And then uh, when you hit on a channel that your device is also on that you're looking for, then you connect. Uh, and low energy, it's much faster. There are only three advertising channels, so we can connect much quicker. So that's kind of the, the different changes uh, from classic to low energy. So when we talk about profiles, um, you know, what's the difference between profiles and protocols? The protocol stack uh, is always used. It's something that's <clears throat> built into the um, into the chip via software. 
Uh, profiles like a use case. Um, uh, so profiles uh, are called services. So um, in order, to, if your device supports a profile, then you have to adhere to the profile specification. Um, you have to list what uh, implementation uh, your conformance statement. You, you have to tell uh, when you list it. You have to show the picks, what they call the picks, uh, and show you what it supports. And also the profile test specification. You've got to pass the testing for that profile. So there are uh, different types of profiles. So the most common one, I suppose, is hands-free profile. So in classic Bluetooth, it's used, as you know, on your phone, in your car, on your headset. That's classic Bluetooth. Um, that's been around for a very long time, uh, and uh, it works very well. So the headset profiles are used uh, with mobile phones, uh, the headset profile was the first introduction, if you like, and then it moved on to the hands, hands-free profile. So it's, it, it encompasses the headset profile. So it's all hands-free profile mainly today. And the hands-free profile, uh, the difference between headset profile and hands-free profile is hands-free profile can do things like number redial, call rating, voice dialing, all the things that you do when you're uh, in your car managing um, phone calls. So that profile, if this headset is registered as a Bluetooth device, uh, it has to list that device, it has to pass all of those tests uh, as per the specification. The radio has to comply with the specification. You know, so there's a lot of testing to do. You need to do interoperability to testing, testing with that headset because there are many, many uh, different types of implementations in the automotive industry. So you've got to do all of that. Uh, there's also a profile called the HID profile, human interface device profile, and this would be for keyboard and mouse, um, and it's based on computing industry standard human interface device specification. So Bluetooth just took that already proven specification and implemented it into the Bluetooth standard. So um, that in the beginning was classic Bluetooth, but mainly HID today is low energy. It's using low energy specification. There's a lower latency with low energy and lower power consumption. Another big profile is A2DP, Advanced Audio Distribution Profile. And this is used for audio streaming. So somebody listening to music on speakers, headsets, they're using that A2DP. Uh, and from their, their source, the phone, they're able to control the, the music, change the volume. So that's where uh, skip tracks, look at different uh, metadata. So that's where the AVRCP, audio video remote control profile, that's all encompassed A2DP and AVRCP. So that's a heavily used, heavily uh, uh, developed profile and in use, great use today. Another profile would be OBEX, object exchange, for sending photographs or documents between devices. Uh, again, OBEX was a specification that was developed in the infrared IR um, specification. Bluetooth say just took that spec, transported or, transported or over to the Bluetooth spec, and um, it works very well. Serial port profile, uh, it's a simple profile replacing RS-232 cable. So a lot of people were using serial port, basically making a wireless serial link and them doing their own proprietary um, exchange over that serial link. Um, it's not used a lot today. I think low energy took away from that because low energy builds that space very well and does that job better. There's a phone book access profile basically for downloading the phone book into the car uh, when you sit in behind the steering wheel and, and turn on your car engine. Uh, phone book access profile will automatically take all your phone records and put them in the car, uh, hands-free kit. Um, okay, that was classic. Uh, Bluetooth low energy. Um, let's just have a look at that. Again, we looked uh, uh, at the Bluetooth classic versus Bluetooth low energy. I won't go over all of that again, but we're going to focus on the Bluetooth low energy stuff here. Uh, just a bit of water. Uh, we talked about the specifications, quickly run through this. 
So I'm looking at version one, version two, three, four, up to version five specification. So uh, one was uh, adaptive frequency hopping, enhanced data rate, secure symbol pairing. That was two, two dot one, three dot zero, plus high speed. This was a great idea, but it never took off. Uh, this was where Bluetooth was good at making a connection between device ad hoc connections, uh, but it wasn't great at sending a lot of data. Wi-Fi was good at sending a lot of data, but not good at making ad hoc connections. Uh, and they got together and said, okay, let Bluetooth make the connection. We'll hand over the data pipe to Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi can send the data. It works very well, but it was never adopted. It's still in the specification. You never know, someday it might come back. I, I always thought it was a good idea. 4.0 plus LE. So 4.0 still uh, carries the classic specification but it has added low energy specification. Introduction of low energy, two megabits. So in the beginning, low energy was low data rate, but that has changed now, changed drastically. Um, and we'll talk about that later. 4.2 uh, was um, low energy special features for the internet of things. Uh, and then five, Bluetooth five, that was a big one. That was a big change for low energy specification. So Bluetooth 5, this is what changed in Bluetooth 5. We had um, higher output power. We had uh, slot available mass. This is improving interoperability. Uh, two megabit five for LE. This is doubling the speed. Long range, we have up to one kilometer range for Bluetooth low energy, which is uh, you know uh, hard to believe. Uh, high duty cycle, so a lot more data throughput. Uh, advertising extensions, and I'll talk a bit about those. Uh, Bluetooth 5.1, we have something called angle of arrival and angle of departure. This is really direction finding. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And um, 5.2, uh, you're talking about isochronous channels. Uh, isochronous channels means channels that are capable of going both ways at the same time. And this is for audio. This is LE audio. Uh, which was never intended, low energy was never intended for audio in the beginning, but now it's going to take over the audio uh, uh, profiles, the audio use cases. So this is all low energy. They're the three big steps uh, going forward, and we're still only rolling, rolling out that stuff. So how is low energy uh, achieved? Uh, low standby time, low duty cycle, as I said, Low energy specification uh, works to keep the radio off as much as possible. Remember, uh, it's not just when you're transmitting that you're burning up battery power. When your receiver is listening, you're burning up the same amount of battery power. So keep your radio off and you extend your battery. And that's a very important for coin cell battery devices like sensors. Uh, it has a faster connection, so less time on the air. Uh, making the connection, that's good. Um, you know, low energy can connect in three milliseconds where it could take up to 100 milliseconds for classic Bluetooth to connect. Uh, low, lower peak power. Peak power is very important for coin cells. One way to kill a coin cell battery is to uh, exceed the peak power limitation. Um, so uh, that's what the Bluetooth specification is working around, low peak power to make that battery cell last as long as possible. Um, on low energy, one device advertises on three advertising channels. So I men mentioned the three advertising channels, channels 37, 38, and 39. So a device will advertise on those. Uh, another device will hear that advertising uh, packet. So he only has to listen on three channels. Uh, he doesn't have to listen on 32 channels like classic. So everything's going to happen a lot quicker. Uh, the second device is scanning for the advertising packets. Um, when advertising packets are found, a connection indication is sent to the advertising and a connection is formed. Uh, privacy, uh, it's very good on privacy. So low energy devices may use random addresses. So uh, dynamically create a random address. So as you know, every Bluetooth device has a, a BD address, like a, a MAC address in, in Wi-Fi. <clears throat> But um, Bluetooth low energy specification uh, can change those addresses. 
uh, on the fly uh, so that it's more difficult to, to track. You have uh, resolvable private addresses, non-resolvable private addresses or static addresses. Um, and those that's very important um, for, from a, a privacy point of view. Uh, for example, uh, iOS devices change their LE address every 15 minutes. So um, it's hard, harder to track that. I'm just going to quickly show you a uh, poster that we can share with you. Um, it's just giving you an indication of all of the different types of addresses that are used on Bluetooth Low Energy. And uh, a flow chart here explaining uh, how, how they work. So that's quite useful. But um, we, can, uh, we can share this poster with you um, later, later on. Back to the uh, presentation. Um, yeah, uh, this is to prevent tracking a device. So privacy is good, security is very good. Uh, into the low energy Bluetooth stack, there is a protocol layer called security management protocol, and that manages and handles all the different types of keys uh, between the devices for encryption, for uh, tracking. Uh, so there are different types of keys that are used um, right throughout the stack. And with um, Bluetooth uh, 5.2, 5 uh, it's even improved a lot more. And with the um, mesh specification that I mentioned earlier, there's even a higher level of security uh, on top of that. So very, very secure, very good. Um, you don't want your wireless being a backdoor into your uh, backbone network. Um, there are four associated models, just works, numeric comparison, out of band, and pass key entry. So when the two devices are uh, pairing or um, communicating, uh, you have something called just works. That's uh, not very secure, but uh, it's handy. It works uh, as, a, as a written just works. The, the two devices connect. You do have encryption. Numeric comparison, you can look at one device or the other and uh, confirm the, the numbers that are showing. Out of band pairing, that's something that's using out of band outside the ISM band. So a use case for that would be a headset and a phone. They could use um, uh, near field communication, NFC. Uh, if you touch the head headset with the phone, NFC will start the pairing process and Bluetooth will complete the pairing process. So you have two technologies completing the pairing process, the creating keys, and that's very secure. So when two devices are paired, what they pair, they know each other. There's something called a long-term key, LTK. Uh, and in classic, they call it the link key, but it's the same thing. Uh, many LE connections are not encrypted, um, but I think that's changing uh, where they, I, I mentioned before on the mesh specification, encryption is mandatory. And so uh, it's good to use encryption. But maybe for a, a sensor, a temperature sensor on the wall, maybe they don't use encryption. You know, who cares? It's only telling you the temperature. Uh, it's equivalent to secure simple pairing. Uh, secure simple pairing was um, a type of, uh, it was a, an improvement in the pairing and the encryption for classic Bluetooth. Uh, for Bluetooth 5, uh, I mentioned Bluetooth 5 was a, a, a big change in the low energy specification. What did it introduce? It doubled the rate. We go to 2 megabit LE. We have long range uh, LE up to 1 kilometer. These different five physical layers, code 5, LE advertising extensions. That gives you data throughput, higher data throughput. Slot available mask. That This is used for um, coexistence. Uh, sharing your slot uh, availability with another technology so that the other technology can, can, can mask when you're transmitting, for example, or something. Uh, high duty cycle, so the duty cycle increases, so that means you can send more packets in a shorter space of time. You're on the air less time. So those things are all introduced in 5. In 5.1, we introduced uh, direction finding, angle of arrival, angle of departure, departure and something called gap caching, which again uh, speeds up the uh, communication, initial communication time between devices. 
and it gives you less on the air time, less on the air time, less battery burn up time. So why was the why were why were all these? What's driving all of all of this? Is really this five five dot one and five dot two? It's the Internet of Things, um, mainly for Bluetooth five, uh, creating new opportunities and how to utilize the Internet of Things. Um, delivering uh, a reliable IoT connection, so uh, longer range, less time uh, on the air, uh, same low power characteristics. So achieving a lot, you know, doubling the speed uh, on, on the air, less time, uh, increasing the capacity throughput, all of those things, and we're making the coexistence better as well. So that's quite an achievement. It's not a selfish technology. It's not, it's not elbowing out Wi-Fi in any way. In fact, it's enhancing the uh, coexistence between these other technologies. So it enhances the adoption of beacons, decreases connection barriers to experience uh, seamless uh, Internet of Things connections. Long range features will enhance IoT connectivity. So new use cases for the long range features, outdoor features for Bluetooth low energy. So that's creating uh, new markets, uh, it's improving the existing markets, so that's a big deal. So what type of markets are we in? We're in sports and fitness, assisted, assisted living, uh, consumer medical, security, home industrial automation, advertising malls, you know, you name it, uh, anywhere where you want to have a robust, uh, ubiquitous standard, Bluetooth uh, wireless standard, uh, and you know the big, almost the big plus for Bluetooth was that it's in the mobile phone. It's in there already. The chip is in there. You didn't have to introduce a new chip uh, when you introduced a new low energy specification. Uh, it's just introducing a new stack uh, onto that same chip. The chip can use the plastic stack or the low energy stack, or it can have just a, a low energy stack on a single chip. So ubiquitous, I mean that by that found everywhere. Uh, you know, it's in the mobile phone, and there are lots of mobile phones around the world. So that means uh, applications on the other side of the phone, um, devices uh, can be controlled from applications that reside on the phone, and you have a ready-made, uh, proven technology standard worldwide, free free band worldwide to to do that. So. Um, and it's got uh, coexistence, includes updates that enhance coexistence with other technologies. Um, so it's already there, the technology is already there. It's just um, you have to come up with the use cases and the devices uh, to utilize that to its best. So Bluetooth 5, I mentioned, uh, doubled the speed of the low energy specification. So 4.0 was one megabit per second. Uh, Bluetooth uh, 5 has low energy specification of two megabits. Longer range, four times the range. So they introduced something called Coded 5. It's a lower data rate, uh, but it can go down to as low as 125 kilobits per second. So low data rate, long range. You're not gonna do high data rate, long range. Um, there are uh, you know, trade-offs when you go into a use case for long range. Um, Greater 800% increase in message capacity. So that's that's massive increase in data throughput that you can uh, do on low energy Bluetooth 4 compared to Bluetooth 5, and imp improve the Bluetooth interoperability coexistence. So Bluetooth 5, big change. Uh, we're still seeing the effect of it. Uh, it's still being rolled out, um, but uh, I think it. Um, it will have a significant change on the use cases and the devices out there. So just to go over those points, double the speed uh, will support faster data transfer over the air. And that means less time on the air as well, more responsive apps, uh, more responsive uh, HID devices, faster update of sensor information. Um, so lots of uh, better improved uh, functionality there. The longer range, quadruples the range, uh, you know, industrial cable replacement, truck range scales, outdoor activity mainly, pipe leaking detection devices, anything over the water. So um, new use cases uh, were um, 
construed there and the, the specification was developed to, to drive those use cases. Uh, higher message capacity, so Bluetooth 4.0, low energy, uh, the data it started off as a low data rate, but uh, that quickly grew into something that was not sufficient and we needed a higher data rate. So they were able to do that very cleverly on the specification. They increased the uh, data, the payload from 37 octets to 255 octet packets. So they've done that cleverly and it works very well. Um, so uh, the ability to offload advertising packets from the three channels. So what they basically did was uh, instead of uh, only having three channels to um, advertise and um, send data on uh, without making a connection, you can offload the advertising channels to the other 32 channels or the other 37 channels uh, if you remember those 40 channels in the energy. So, uh, it's a clever way of increasing your data throughput. And then the, the, the slot available mask and all of those, that's basically improving coexistence. Uh, it makes the technology work better with Wi-Fi, DECT, ZigBee, uh, any of those other 2.4 gigahertz te technologies that are out there. So better overall, overall interoperability. So Bluetooth 5, as I said, was a, a quantum leap. It's a, a, it's a big improvement, a lot of work, um, but it will um, make things a lot better. New IoT mark, market, low latency, scalability. So th I'm talking here about the mesh specification. So the mesh specification is a separate working group, a, ser a separate specification that sits on top of Bluetooth 5 or Bluetooth 4 or whatever, either either one of the specifications, 4 or 5, low energy or classic. So uh, the main thing it is, it's it's replacing or not replacing, it's moving into the wireless network space. So very large wireless networks. Uh, that space was never very well served. Uh, I would say that Zigbee uh, was in that space. Uh, it never really uh, mushroomed as a as a technology in that space. We think that Bluetooth low energy mesh uh, or Bluetooth mesh specification has the uh, learned from you know the previous wireless network specification. Uh, it has the low latency. It certainly has the scalability. You can scale it up. Um, uh, minimum power consumption. It has a very high security level. And so, uh, what's that space, I would say. 5.1 specification. So now that we have all of the technology enhanced features of 5.0, we can move ahead with new use cases. What 5.1 basically brings is something called angle of arrival and angle of departure. This is really all about uh, direction finding and asset tracking. So, um, Direction finding uh, until 5.0 Bluetooth low energy already allows location services via proximity. So you were able to sort of roughly guess maybe where a device, how far away a device was. There was something called RSSI, which is a receiver signal strength indicator. That's the signal strength at your antenna. So if it was weak, you know your device is probably far away. If it was strong RSSI signal level, you knew it was close. But you didn't have a good indication of what direction it was in. To determine the angle angle between two devices directly, which supports two methods to do that. We have one method is called the angle of arrival, and the other one is called the angle of departure. Now this is all very complex stuff, mathematical stuff that's in these two use cases. You can learn more about it here uh, if you want. But uh, generally speaking, uh, in a short introduction like this, let's have a look at angle of ar arrival. So here we have the transmitter. That could be your mobile phone moving device. So it has one antenna, single antenna, and it sends out the AOA uh, packet from the transmitter. And then you have a receiver in a fixed position. And you have an RF switch here, which has an array of antennas. 
these are small antennas, maybe a wavelength or half a wavelength apart. Um, so you know, not taking not big antennas. This this is a small, relatively small radio space. So this uh, packet that arrives on the array of antennas will have a different angle of arrival on each antenna, and from that information, there will be IQ information uh, inside the packet, data inside the packet, and we can determine from that data which direction, uh, what angle the device is coming from, or where, what direction it's in. So that's one use case. Angle of departure is kind of the opposite. Um, so you could have a fixed device is the transmitter, and he's sending out the AOD packet, and the moving device, the receiver here, we can get those four packets coming with four different data information and we can determine from that data inside those AOD packets what direction that fixed position is in. So there are two use cases uh, for, you know, one is for asset tracking, another one is for uh, position, position finding. Um, so uh, I think you can read up more on, on um, location services, look at the Bluetooth website, but as I say, it's, it's quite complex but um, it's not really in the market yet, but I think um, you know, this is gonna be, the use cases will be you know, following your kid around the supermarket or your pet in the park and stuff like that, seeing how far away it is. And asset tracking for industry is also a huge issue. So they're the kind of use cases that will, that will be used. Then 5.2, so that was 5.1. 5.0 was the, you know, the tech, bringing the technology on. 5.1 is really uh, direction finding AOA and AOD. 5.02 is all about asynchronous channels. Asynchronous channels means cha audio channels that are going in both directions at the same time. So in the beginning, low energy was you know, not for audio. It didn't have the capacity, didn't have the data rate. You, know, you wanted to save battery power, not a use case. Audio was out. But now uh, they've developed it that uh, low energy will be the audio uh, technology specification in the future. So um, here we have, like, this is just a simple view. This could be a mobile phone. These are the synchronous channels here. So you have a headset and a phone. So you're sending over an asynchronous channel. You're sending two channels uh, for your left and your right headset speaker at the same time. And there's an isochronous channel. There's a voice coming back here uh, if you have a phone call. So that was very difficult to do. They had to do um, in the past with uh, classic Bluetooth. It wasn't possible with low energy, but now they've developed the specification. It's still in, in work, uh, but uh, it's going to be very significant. And the Bluetooth SIG are putting a lot of effort into marketing LE audio. They believe it's going to be uh, very, it's going to be huge, and it's going to be better. Uh, low energy audio enables longer battery life, so that's that's a big factor. Uh, we'll be able to broadcast audio support, um, so you can send uh, audio out to many many devices at the same time. You can have audio sharing, so a group could be watching a, a movie with the headsets and sharing the audio within that. Uh, that, that small space together. Uh, hearing aid, uh, there's a lot of work going on in Bluetooth in the hearing aid space. So um, yeah, a lot of good work going on there. Um, and that's where LE audio is going. That's what Bluetooth 5.2 is about. Uh, it's the next generation of Bluetooth audio. And streaming, audio streaming today, the codecs I use is very good, very high quality. Uh, but they're saying that Bluetooth low energy audio will have uh, better audio quality than existing A2DP uh, that is streaming today. So that's that's quite exciting. And lower battery life, um, which is uh, amazing. Um, so we're almost done, I think. Um, these are some other resources that you can have a look at, some stuff that you might find interesting. Uh, Tell the Lacroix stuff, um, Bluetooth brand, usage guide licensing. 
And you know, we are available. As I say, we're not just uh, selling analyzers and, and and that. We we support our customers. Um, if you have questions, we're we're more than happy to uh, engage and, and talk about and talk about all of that. So uh, I think that covers everything. Uh, I was going to we can share this with you. Uh, and if there are any questions now, and maybe Rohan, you can jump in and uh, address those. Yes, please uh, send any questions if uh, uh, if you have it in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry for for the, the sound problem here. Uh, we will send the recording and also the presentation to you. Uh, that was one of the questions. So yes, we will send the presentation in PDF and also the recording. So if you missed something uh, in the sound, uh, you can. Playback. Any more question? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Um, it was very good, except for, for this, some sound problems in, in the middle there. I think it was very good. Okay. So uh, have a, a safe uh, or a safe evening at uh, Green Island. Okay. 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 Thank Everybody you. keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you.